So, um, let us start with the issue of interoperability and uh, my objective is to essentially um, deal with the variety of interoperability issue and how um, semantic technologies plays role in our ability to handle the you know support variety or handle the uh, interoperability challenge. So, um, before I go into the variety and mod modify you know uh, address that and some of you are aware of these things. So, um, do not have to answer, uh, but I want to motivate the key role of semantics. We will we'll see the role of semantics in this um, course both for the variety and the velocity issue right. And you will see uh, how semantics is supported differently for dealing with different V issues. But just to understand that and this is more, more meant for those of you who are not really exposed to semantic issues, many of you are here in this audience. Um, that um, you hear today a lot about AI, but I think um, a, a significant overlap of the AI is now with what we uh, would call semantic technologies. And um, if you look at some of the most important um, things that have happened in the a broader consumer space for the use of web um, then um, and, and things over the internet, then you will see that uh, these are some of the uh, significant research innovations um, uh, and, and technological innovations that are out there. And in each of the cases, semantics as we will discuss plays some role, right. Uh, it is not always in isolation in that you will find that there will be techniques that are um, they start out as um, uh, traditional information retrieval techniques. Um, they do not necessarily take the semantic approach and then they are somehow handing over the processing to the semantic techniques. So, there is often information retrieval techniques, machine learning techniques and those AI techniques work hand in hand with uh, the semantic techniques that we will discuss. Uh, and, and sometimes um, uh, there is no um, clear demarcation of what is non-semantic versus what is semantic. Uh, non-semantic may mean that it basically deals with structure of the data or syntax of the data and that it does not uh, care about what is the meaning of the data and semantic is something where it cares about the meaning of the data right? what it stands for, how it is relevant to a domain or application or human utilizing that data. So, these are uh, you know important technologies where a semantics is playing um, uh, a role. Um, just stepping back a bit, uh, what happened was that um, about five years ago, um, maybe seven years ago or so, uh, there was high, the, 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 I think there was more of a start of realization that semantic technologies are um, um, uh, likely to become practically viable. So, before that there was a lot of techniques, a uh, lot of um, um, uh, talk about semantics and the semantic web term was introduced in 1999 as you know, uh, but um, around uh, 2008 is where I think we started to really see the value of uh, semantics uh, come up, bubble up. One thing that has in a way played in uh, you know important role uh, uh, for people to accept semantics uh, has to do with a scaling up in that um, earlier much of the semantic uh, technologies relied upon uh, humans uh, essentially creating so called ontologies and we will talk about ontologies creating the knowledge basis or knowledge models. And that um, one I think important um, uh, game changer has been Wikipedia in that um, uh, you know many many people hundreds of thousands of people uh, collaborated to create this common knowledge even though much of it is in unstructured and semi-structured form. And then people found opportunity to create structures from that, that once you make the uh, uh, information represent more uh, in a more structured form, it becomes easier for algorithms to utilize that, right. So, people found ways to uh, extract uh, relevant information from the Wikipedia data to make it more usable. Uh, and ap apply that for um, you know getting some level of semantic support. 
And for example, uh, this early uh, company called PowerSet, which was then acquired by uh, Microsoft for about 100 million, uh, I think was one of the first acquisition in the semantic space. Where, um, and, and the interesting thing here is that um, uh, PowerSet not only paid attention to uh, string to things or keywords to entities, but it also tried to extract relationships. Okay. Um, then came uh, Apple CD where uh, model, domain models um, created, um, uh, there, there were some researchers at SRI International, and um, uh, that creation of domain knowledge model helped uh, people ask localized queries and get answers to them. And then, of course, that was coupled with other technologies like speech to text conversion and such. So um, those things started to come together, and uh, Siri was um, uh, developed. Although you know that uh, uh, those, those of you who have used Siri know that uh, it has been uh, quite uh, brittle at times. And uh, part of that uh, has to do with the fact that the, its ability to create new knowledge is still quite limited. Right? So that is where they are working on. In fact, the game uh, is likely to be won by those who find the ways to uh, create massive uh, amount of knowledge um, and, uh, and keep it up to date all the time. So while there have been academic um, work like NEL at CMU and a number of others that uh, we may mention in the class, um, uh, the, in fact, now uh, Google uh, is working pretty intently into trying to uh, rep make, uh, make further advance the work in extracting uh, data from um, broader sources, uh, you know, than than what have been done before. So, yeah, everybody can access Wikipedia and have uh, leverage that, but uh, that has only so much knowledge. Then you can complement that with explicit knowledge from biomedical domain, uh, clinical domain. Um, uh, and, and so on and so forth as you need and make it wider. Um, and, 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 and you'll see that um, uh, different companies have taken different steps towards semantics. So for example, use of graph is clearly a step towards better support of semantics. And so Facebook, for example, this graph uh, model um, that, you know, that they've been using, uh, that adds to semantics. And I think they are doing some very uh, cool things that we'll see. Now, um, on the other hand, um, there have been a work uh, on standardization of semantic technologies and semantic uh, web data representation uh, that has also come to play. But the key thing has been about um, uh, uh, ability to annotate the data, right, uh, and um, uh, or, or or capture metadata. And earlier, uh, there have been uh, techniques uh, such as uh, RDFA uh, and microdata and other forms of uh, you know, uh, data representation. And people um, thought that we can do high quality data extraction. To some extent, that is still possible. And it is possible. It is being used. But then people realize that why can't we use uh, uh, community's own energy? Uh, the same way PageRank, in a way, masterfully used uh, in a, you know, um, the, the, the social aspects of uh, creating web in that who is pointing to whom, to its advantage for ranking. Um, uh, I think the search engine de decided that um, uh, because ranking of the content is valuable for any content owner, why don't we provide the mechanisms for letting the content developers do the necessary hard work, which is distributed among all the people. And that is what, uh, you know, essentially push for schema.org. What is interesting is that all the major search engines uh, got together to uh, make schema.org pre pre present. Now, uh, all of them access to schema.org, the difference is how well they can utilize it, right? And the interesting thing here is that, um, um, Anytime you want human to do some work, uh, you have to keep it somewhat simpler, right? So um, you have to necessarily keep schema.org um, somewhat uh, broad-based and somewhat easier to use. More complex you make, harder it is for content developer to understand, and that would make um, uh, its uh, uh, the, you know, adoption harder. 
right? So then what do you do? So the smart thing you have to do is to let it be still simple for content developer and enhance its value by your own knowledge base. So when I can combine my schema.org with uh, my knowledge graph, which I've been developing independently, I can make it make the data, metadata that content developers provided more valuable uh, than uh, it is in itself. So uh, you may remember, and I'll show you probably uh, something about um, semantic enhancement of the data. So I have data. I have somebody who has provided the metadata, uh, such as in schema.org. And then I have some additional way to uh, you know, make um, uh, to extension. For example, the person simply says uh, Springfield. Uh, well, there are 13 Springfield in, uh, in, in the United States. Which one it is? If you can figure out an algorithm to automatically disambiguate which Springfield it is, and then say it is Springfield, Ohio, that tagging became a lot more meaningful. Right? So, so what I'm saying is that humans will only do so much, and then you will be able to provide um, the rest. And the analogy is very simple. Just say that uh, I say an arbitrary word. I say um, uh, Athens. Right? Um, now, immediately, um, you can uh, think of several Athens. There is Athens, Ohio. There is Athens, Georgia. Of course, there is Athens, Greece. Right? What did you do? You took the word Athens, and you, you know, did trailblazing to different Athenses, and you disambiguated that. You use your knowledge of the Athens that you know. Some of you know three Athens, others may know more than three Athens. Right? And the same way, if I had that knowledge in, the, in, you know, in my computing infrastructure, then I would know that this Athens could be this, 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 and then possibly I can ask question which Athens that is. Right? So that's what is happening with regards to the semantics. So um, uh, there is brief history about semantics. I don't want to go uh, through this. In, um, uh, as you know, the term was itself uh, coined in this book, um, 1999 uh, you know, book. But the work on semantics in terms of uh, information, data, and web um, has been there in, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, by mid of 1990s, uh, that, that, has, that, that there were several projects along that line, including some of the projects that my lab had uh, uh, done. Um, all right, and so a lot more to be read, um, you know, at this link uh, that some of you have uh, read, and um, uh, John, you'll be able to, you know, that link will, you know, the slides are there. I think there's a um, extensive history, uh, or at least my personal perspective on the 15 year of uh, movement in the semantics per se. I'm I ca I'm capturing some of the things here, but there's a lot more there. It's one also my, from my LinkedIn profile. Now, I've uh, come up with a very simple way to introduce semantics and semantic web. And I call there just the three fundamental components of that. The first component, so one, two, three of semantic web, um, and in fact, there is this uh, picture that, uh, this picture is from year 2002. Uh, I, had, I had started a company in 1999. Uh, I believe this was the first semantic web company, commercial company. Um, and uh, they also, you know, we also had a uh, patent filed in 2000, awarded in 2001, uh, before the well-known uh, semantic web uh, article. It was filed in the, um, March of 2000, I think. Um, and um, that captures this one, two, three. And let me briefly describe here. On the right, top corner uh, is a mechanism of machinery that has to do with creation of knowledge or reference information or ontology. Right? There are different words. There are nuances uh, between ontology and knowledge graph and schema. And we can talk about that later on. At, that abstract, at the abstract level, there's something to do with uh, coming up with common interpretation of data. That you and I, there is a well-known song. You say tomato, I you say tomato, I say tomato. You know, you say potato, I say potato. That, you know, that, but but the, what the, the, these two these things uh, mean the same thing, right? 
that aspect is key, is the first item of that, that is key aspect of that. It's also a technical term would be ontological commitment. That multiple users, community of users or experts or whosoever they are, agree upon co common interpretation of um, uh, concept. It, they say, oh, there are different labels, but they mean the same thing. They come to the agreement. You can say terminolo terminological coherence, nomenclature, all these different ways you can say the same thing. And, the, and then, in addition to the agreement, there is actual fact. The fact may be that, uh, you know, Fairborn has this particular geographical boundary. That the 2001 census or 2011 census of Fairborn had this population. These are facts. Right? They don't change. So common interpretation and the facts together really creates this one component of uh, the semantic architecture, semantic technology architecture. Okay, and there are different ways of creating it. Uh, you know whether we can uh, discuss in this course or not. The second is you take different kind of data and create metadata or tagging or labeling or annotation, whatever you call it, with reference to this common uh, this respect of this ontology, consisting of both the ontological commitment or common interpretation and the facts or the knowledge. Right? With respect to that, you take variety of data. You can have database, XML data feed, websites, emails, uh, reports, documents, whatever you have, right? You have streaming data. And then you have the mechanism here to refer to this thing as well as some other techniques. So here I may have automatic classification, I may have machine learning, I may have lexical rules, right? Variety of different ways, uh, the, in combination of both of these, uh, which is uh, statistical techniques and, uh, and semantic techniques, together can help you interpret this data and come up with the lab labels or metadata. So that is component number two. And the three, component number three is simply to utilize this metadata for your application. The application could be search, could be browsing, could be advertisement, could be reasoning to find other related things that I can derive or deduce from whatever I already know. Any of those things you can do, uh, and so you can, you can visualize the data, you can uh, you know, uh, convert from the data that you have into events. All those processing are summed up here. But the idea is that if you understand the data such that you can uh, you remove yourself from just purely syntax, the strings that the data makes up of, the, the, the way data is described to the computer, and make it a little bit more meaningful as we humans who interpret it, all your application will be semantic. More, you know, would, would, you will be able to associate more meaning with that, right? All right, so number one is ontology, which is an agreement with common vocabulary and, um, uh, you know, or nomenclature, concept, and so on and so forth. It is consist, it can it typically consist of schema and the knowledge, or it is a description and description base, or it is um, uh, intentions and extensions. There are many different ways, whether you come from database world or AI world. Uh, knowledge represented world, people use different words. But basically, at some level, there is schema and uh, concept description with common interpretation, and then instantiation of it uh, the f that are the basic known facts, right? So that is that. And so, and the idea here is that um, this, is, this represents agreement which enables interoperability. Our, we interoperate at the natural language basis. I speak words in English sentences in English, phrases in English, and you're able to understand that. We have that interoperability, right? And uh, with you know, years of our training in the language have given the common basis with which we uh, uh, you know, reach agreement. Yet, um, uh, all of you are listening to the same words, are interpreting slightly differently, because you have your own knowledge base, uh, your own experiences, uh, with respect to which you are interpreting my thing. So there will be some common uh, understanding, some different understanding, right? Um, the point here is that uh, you, you do get the interoperability because of that agreement. And additionally, um, the better, more formal description you use compared to the strings that you have, it improves your ability to uh, you know, process through machine, uh, through, through algorithms. 
So what the second item then is to use that um, ontology um, uh, to annotate the data. So it is about associating meaning with the data, right? And uh, I, I, you know, as I said in the past, it's like you, you have your image and you are putting tags to the image. Well, your tags are your way of interpreting that image. In fact, the same image may be interpreted from multiple ways. I can have a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, picture, uh, classic picture, impressionist like a picture here, and somebody may describe the art, other may describe how valuable it is. Right, so there, you, there can be different viewpoints, right? And uh, a, what is the analogy of that? Analogy for us would be that you have the same document or same data, but you have multiple uh, um, uh, domains uh, and conceptual frameworks from which each with modeled with uh, appropriate ontologies, and you use multiple of them, two or more of them, to annotate the data. Right, so I can annotate the data with regards to this ontology and I annotate the same data with regards to other ontology. Right? and have more of the metadata. Um, uh, now, this process can be manual, can be, so for example, there are a lot of uh, disciplines, for example, in biomedicine, where people do, uh, you know, do manual annotations, typically gene reef uh, kind of annotations done manually. Uh, uh, MASH terms uh, uh, to PubMed articles are done manually, right, by typically PhDs, uh, uh, you know, who actually are paid to actually annotate the data read the uh, uh, you know uh, journal papers and actually do the annotations and they can be semi automatic uh, and you know they're like automatic with human verification typically the reason for human verification is the uh, challenges the algorithm face for disambiguation that is one of the most important reason why uh, it's possible for that um, algorithms make error or or are not complete can't completely identify and correct correctly or completely label something, and the humans can complement that. Human can curate or validate, and then completely automatically, right? Which you, which will often have some errors or more errors. Um, so one way of uh, going from uh, syntax and low level thing to semantics is this way. You can say that at the lower level I have data, you have structured, semi-structured, unstructured data. Your data data of different modalities. Your image data, video data, and so on and so forth. You have data of you know gene you know sequencing data variety of things. Then comes syntactic metadata. So it is something that you can very easily and uniquely identify. For example, what is the size of the file? What is the encryption? What is the calling API? All those things are syntactic things. They don't have to deal with what is in the data. They talk about data in general. Then uh, there, there is uh, how the data is organized so that you can easily go through the data, that is captured by the structural metadata. Most important is the semantic metadata, where it says what it is. They say, oh, I'm looking at image, and in that image there is organ of liver, and that within that liver there is a patho pathological structure, abscess, abscess located in the liver, right? So that gives you meaning. This has, you know, the data has simply pixels. This is, uh, say, oh, my file size is this, and this is a, a file of some kind, um, you know, uh, you know, JPEG file or whatever that is. This says, you know, um, you, you know, again, if I, if, uh, the way data is organized, there is some, um, you know, metadata tag uh, in terms of um, uh, like exif information that may be there if uh, there was a uh, image that may be all here. Then this is a lot more. But this is the data that human is after. This is the data that application is after. And ontology gives the framework for you to you know, capture that. And you go from, you know, express, you, you go towards higher expressiveness and improve your ability to do reasoning as you go up. There's another slide which kind of looks similar, but uh, provides you different um, understanding of, you know, uh, of, of, of uh, how you think about semantics. So look at this thing. Something says 150. 150 is simply a string, right, or a number. And that is simply raw data. Um, then somebody labels it. So the, here now, right there, you can describe that as a semantic or you may not. But it's label, right? So you can call it to the extent it's a semantic label. But this is one level. So I'm showing you different levels of semantic uh, you know, uh, interpretations. Um, so it's a systolic blood pressure of 150 mmHg. 
So, uh, and that can be, you know, represented, uh, you know, in RDF, for example. Then you have something uh, that says, you know, that actually is an elevated blood pressure. That happens to be an NIH, uh, you know, a clinical standard uh, that tells you how to interpret blood pressure. And for systolic pressure of above 140 is called elevated blood pressure, right? And so that is something, and you may model the concept of elevated blood pressure in a higher level, uh, you know, represent, colonized representation, let's say owl, right? Which has a threshold constraint, for example, and value that you can express here, and hence you can call it elevated blood pressure. But um, uh, unfortunately, elevated blood pressure is not sufficient for a doctor to decide what uh, medication to give. You need to figure out whether, uh, because elevated blood pressure can be for multiple reasons, such as hyperthyroidism or hypertension. Medications and other treatment protocols for e each of those things are different. So it is necessary to go yet another level up, whereby I'm going from this simply elevated blood pressure to a diagnosis. Okay, and this is where the data becomes, you know, this data is really much more meaningful. Why do you measure, um, you know, blood pressure? Because you suspect maybe something, uh, you know, maybe you don't have normal blood pressure, and if it is not, you want to do something about it, right? To do something about it, you have to have this level of understanding of that data before you can do anything about it, right? So this becomes very valuable. Now you see, the you know, I, I call this different level of abstractions. All these level can be called semantics, and yet there is you know, a successive, um, uh, you know, uh, refinement and improvement over our understanding of the data. That makes the things very meaningful, very important. The last is reasoning or computation, whatever you can do in terms of improved computation over the, that, that uh, you know, increases the use of the data, increases the value of that data. And it can be uh, semantic uh, search, uh, integration, answering complex query, question answering system that uh, use semantics. Um, you know, it can be finding paths and subgraphs and correlations and, uh, you know, patterns and many, many different ways. But the fact that um, we have semantic uh, web data or data represented in a semantic web standard uh, would allow us to support this computation much more easily, right? So how well you can set up that pipeline from the data to going to the high level of interpretation of the data makes for very important thing. Now, um, there has been a number of, uh, stand, you know, th there has been a key standardization effort, uh, which is important, and it is playing some role, not a, as big a role as it was conceived. So, um, for, for many years, we've been a member of uh, World Wide Web Consortium, um, uh, and uh, uh, we were quite involved in the development of uh, some of the standards, not necessarily the ones I'm going to show you here. But so these standards, you know, the, the web, uh, you know, where everything uh, has a um, uh, identification where it is. So this is unif uniform resource identifier. And there's been another standard for data exchange called XML. Above that, uh, over that are these uh, key uh, semantic web standards that have been developed by World Wide Consortium. So RDF, resource description framework, RDF schema, uh, query language, uh, and our, uh, you know, the web ontology language for representation of, uh, you know, knowledge uh, or ontologies, and then there is um, rules based specification. Right? Um, now, what is interesting, and the comment I would make is that uh, today, uh, many academic applications use that, and many commercial applications don't use this. Right? So it is important to understand that um, uh, uh, the, the the thing I want to emphasize for you is uh, that it is important to uh, understand the, uh, the uh, semantics and the, what semantics brings you and how do you uh, utilize semantic approach to get what you want. It is not that important uh, or it is less important whether you achieve it through a particular mechanism uh, and, and use a particular standard. Typically it is good that you use standard and, um, but what happens here is that um, many companies rightly or wrongly believe that data is the power and that they hold a lot of data and they want to leverage the, you know, obviously get power from that, you know. And, but, uh, you know, obviously their developers and engineers and decision makers come from different fields, come from different mindset, have had different training. 
And uh, also, there are practical issues as in terms of, uh, for a while, uh, it takes time to build up machinery uh, that is high performance. I'll give you one interesting example from my own thing. I was at uh, Bell Communications Research. Uh, I am talking about the year of 1986, right? And um, it was already Oracle version 5 or maybe 6 or 7, I don't know. I think, what is now, Oracle 12? 11, 12, yeah? Something like that. Okay. But think about it. There was already more than a decade spent. And uh, the, uh, you know, I was part of a group that was deciding whether to uh, replace an existing network model based application, network database application, into relational application. Right? So what it tells you is that it takes at least a decade, and my rule of thumb is 15 years, actually, for technology to menu, uh, mature. Remember, uh, we develop uh, technology, uh, and I think it was relatively scalable, actually. If I had money, I would have done it. Uh, but in, 19, in year 2000, 2001, we had pretty much uh, a pretty good decent uh, semantic search engine. But the mainstream, as everybody, the whole world will take notice, uh, coming from Google, was in 2013. Right? Um, the federal database paper work that we did was in late 1980s. But the, uh, and, and I was part of three uh, you know, uh, prototypes and systems that uh, developed federal databases. But the commercial product from IBM came uh, 15 years after that. Right? So it just takes a lot of time to mature for technology to keep up with the size and complexity of the real world data sets, and hence, uh, these things have been maturing. They have been doing a lot of progresses, and yet some people already had a lot of data, and they decided to use uh, whatever way they could do it for uh, meeting their performance and eff efficiency needs uh, to utilize the data they had. So they went through it, um, you know, uh, uh, unlabeled graph, then went to label graph. They may not be label. The label graph may not exactly have RDF format, but it captures many important parts, key part of the RDF, which is. Relationship as a first class object. Right? Okay. So, let's just a very brief introduction uh, to um, uh, RDF. Uh, RDF is Resource Description Framework, and um, you can capture things uh, like this. So, company has headquarters located in a particular location uh, and has a research lab located in uh, you know, this other location. And so, it's a, um, I think it became started in 1998, pretty early on. Okay? I remember actually uh, having a paper in 1998 that used RDF to describe the links between two objects on the web. Right? So when you had href, um, uh, I described, we, we, had, we developed something called mref, and we used RDF to capture the metadata of that link. And that was 1998. But anyway, that is the time that it was developed. And so it has been uh, quite some time uh, out there. Um, in that sense, I would say that it has taken a quite, it has taken quite a bit of time for its adoption in mainstream industries. Um, uh, now, you can, you know, so IDF essentially um, has, um, you know, so called triple structure. So uh, you, you would express things as a subject. This is what the triple is about. This is what the fact is about. A predicate, a property that describes this thing, uh, the relationship, property, attribute, whatever you call it, and an object, the value of this property. Right? And you can have uh, it in different forms. Um, uh, important thing is that everything is um, a UR, you know, URI or URL, and say so they are web addressable resources. So you know, uniquely know what that is. And there are a lot of interesting things that happen. For example, think about um, relation databases. And think that you have um, something like IBM, or you have something like this location. Right? There are two things out there. They will remain distinct computationally. It will be very hard unless you, in application, ap explicitly say that they are the same. They will remain differently. And once you put an application, it's a siloed thing. It's a stout tech. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 stovetop. So, 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 um, uh, sorry, stovepipe. Um, and, 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 and hence, the, whatever is in the application won't be shared with the other application. 
right? Uh, we are talking about you know program written in C, C++ or whatever. But because IBM has this link, uh, because it is a it, it is addressed uniformly. If there are two uh, two IBMs out there, I have an opportunity to ask: Are they the same or not? And then I have an opportunity to assert somewhere in the web infrastructure that I say they are the same. Right? So that, that, that is a very powerful thing that we get when you can address the things. That means when I made the disambiguation between the two things, saying they are same as, they are same, or they are not same as, that it can be shared. And now others can use that too. Right? And that can be shared sort of declaratively. Uh, you can have two types of properties, uh, you know, a, another web resource or a literal. You know, it's, excited, it's an integer. Like that, okay. So it uh, has total employees that and now much fewer than that, by the way. So um, uh, one way uh, you can see RDF has a graph model, and our own, um, you know, uh, uh, Win uh, is doing research in this area, and she has developed a formal model called uh, uh, Singleton uh, property model, and uh, that's in fact also used by you know in one of the projects funded by AFRL. Uh, and then there is another notation called triple notation, which is something you are familiar with. IBM company uh, company is this, uh, uh, has total employees this, and uh, number is that. So uh, you know, and then when you have objects of similar types, this uh, sorry, these triples of similar types, then you can use a schema. So company headquarters located in the uh, geographic location. And um, that gives you, uh, you know, uh, the ability to uh, describe group of resources, right? Uh, what is the what is the most important uh, thing about relational model? That it was set theory, that you can talk about all of these things in, uh, you know, in, in, in the same go, right? So uh, schemas are of course very important for organizing uh, the things, and that's what RDF schema supports there. And um, here's just uh, uh, an example of that. So company uh, headquartered in um, that, and here you are different. Oh, you can also express class hierarchy or taxonomy uh, using the subclass of. So you can say that all of these are subclass of company. So uh, ontology, I already described them. So let us, I just want to uh, make, um, OK. Sparkle is a query language. And with the query language, you can describe a pattern. So I'm looking for any company here, um, and that uh, is located in a location, has headquartered at a particular location, right? So, and, and then the idea is to, um, the result of that is a, uh, you know, values that can replace that particular query pattern, values that match that query pattern, right? Um, so uh, here is an example query pattern, and here are, Kind of the results, right? And this sort of there is some level of um, conformity with uh, SQL that many of that probably all of you are familiar with. So you can see all these companies are located in, and these are the answers. And there are various constructs uh, uh, that um, uh, Sparkle has. I won't go much into detail of these. Uh, other thing I want to simply mention is that uh, ontology can be of very broad variety. Uh, so ontology can be very simple. Uh, so uh, there are there is a place, for example, where uh, over 300 um, ontologies in biomedical domains are collected, called bioportal.org, National Center for Biomedical Ontologies, right? Uh, we ourselves, uh, our group has uh, done a given couple of those ontologies. Uh, and uh, so they can be simple ontology. This is an ontology, this is a subset of an ontology I used um, in the uh, a working system, uh, operationally deployed system for electronic medical record uh, records, uh, a semantic uh, electronic medical record system. Uh, yeah, it was active semantic EMR, electronic medical record system, um, where uh, this is the drug ontology. And a lot of things are not shown, but it just shows kind of core components of that. So you can see that there's a thing, prescription drug, prescription drug, gen generic, uh, you know, or brand name. And so you can express this kind of stuff. And uh, there are a few more other you know, properties that were also captured here. 
and you can see subclass, class, subclass. But ontology can be extremely complicated. So, this one expresses a biomedical pathway, you know, and what happens in human body and all the chemical reactions that happen. It is incredibly, oops, complex. So, I am describing one little part of that, that particular thing and uh, this is uh, uh, Glucknac uh, at position 2 uh, and this is particular enzyme, uh, you know, base reaction. This is the chemical, uh, you know, reaction there and then there is a uh, expression of that in owl. And this modeling of course, is pretty time consuming, pretty challenging. But the point here is that such things are done when there is enough value. So, uh, just uh, showing you and now imagine uh, just each of those links are represented with these complex structures and then imagine the ontology as a whole for the whole pathway, right, can be extremely complicated. We had developed one ontology called Proprio which had 500 classes and it was 11 level deep, right. So, um, and those ontologies took about 2 to 3 years to develop which will be a um, uh, very close afford between computer scientists and uh, domain scientists in that case biochemical researcher, right. Um, and uh, uh, the point is that when you are trying to do such things, uh, only a few humans have that knowledge. So, much of this effort have to be uh, uh, manual. So, you, you use protege, you use other tool for designing ontology and develop this kind of thing. As opposed to let us say knowledge graph about content on the web and uh, for searching uh, data of the kind that you may find in Wikipedia, that is far broad based and I can use lot more automation in those things. So, let us see little bit about semantic metadata extraction and notations. The point here is that you can have data of any kind and basically I write an extractor to create the metadata or annotator, you can use the word annotator here also to get your annotation. An annotation you can get would be semantic annotation if you uh, use uh, this uh, semantic framework. So, this thing some of you have already seen that recently, uh, others I will remind you of. But if you look at this, this is a system, uh, this was implemented, I think this is a slide from year 2002. And so, uh, it is annotating this whole text is standards and poor's 500 index. And it understands that to be one of the financial indexes. or that Europe is a continent. So, there is a, a geography related ontology and there is a financial market related ontology and it is annotated with respect to both of them. Plus, there is a generic annotation of things like date which is not domain specific, it is domain independent. Right? And in addition, you have a, a relationship ontology such as competes with. In those days, Oracle used to compete with PeopleSoft. Oracle ended up buying people soft uh, soon after this slide was generated, ok. So, um, this is an example that shows annotation with regards to multiple ontologies. So, you have domain ontology which talks about uh, you know uh, some of the terms. Uh, it uh, has a, a spatial ontology of location and it has time ontology. Now, this is very relevant to some of the things we are going to sh see later in the class because we are going to be able to, uh, you know, we are going to talk about uh, streaming data, but the data will, you know, be ca let's say the data is captured by multiple sensors. Then, of course, time is there for every, you know, in the stream, the time is there, uh, but uh, let's say that the sensor is observing a particular location. So, you can embed that location information and the data itself, uh, let's say data is vehicular traffic, then you have vehicle, vehicle related transportation ontology that you can use to incorporate that. Suppose you are doing satellite data or drone data, you will have correspondingly different ont in ontology for that data and so such. But it is important to notice that you will have often uh, some domain independent, typically space and time kind of thing and domain specific ontologies uh, to be utilized, right. And so, some matter uh, for some things uh, you may need multiple ontologies. For example, uh, for vehicle data, I may be interested in studying, uh, you know, suppose I am talking about, I am looking at New York, New York uh, City uh, and uh, I am looking at all the objects uh, on the road. Well, I may be interested in, in one case uh, study of uh, 
uh, you know, human crossing of the roads. Uh, that will require different kind of things compared to uh, vehicles, uh, you know, uh, going through the street. Right? So you can have all of those things. Here is an example of data that comes from a file from mass spectroscopy. Right? Or this might as well be a satellite data. And there, I would annotate the data uh, that will look like that. So it will show you what, what this number stands for. And these are concepts described in your ontology. Right? Now, such things can be done fully automatically. Because the file uh, st uh, format is standard or, 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 or fixed. And you know what number uh, comes up where. And hence, you can automatically annotate. You know what uh, data types there should be. Uh, and you can automatically create that. Here is an interesting example. Uh, in this, is, this is a personalized digital medicine application. This is something that we are currently, we have developed right now, and we are actually trying with real uh, patients. Uh, this one is for, uh, let's say, uh, asthma. In fact, we do have application for asthma in children, uh, where we have a bunch of sensors. They talk to the mobile phone or uh, tablet, and then we do, uh, you know, a semantic engine that process is reasoning that data to tell you how well you are doing with regards to your disease and uh, what are the vulnerability uh, with respect to which you need to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, pay attention to. So here you have different sensors. You can see here very different kinds of data coming from the sensors. Here you see the, uh, you know, expert knowledge, background knowledge that is create that that. Uh, it has helped you create an ontology. And here you can see the annotations all done automatically for a variety of data. Now, this is the important thing. Let me bring much of the things together in this slide. We started out the presentation as saying the challenge is variety and we want to have interoperability. Right? So now you have a lot of variety here. Where does the interoperability come from? It, so you see what happened with all these different kinds of data. Uh, and heterogeneity here, we got annotation. The, uh, this annotation happens to be in a semantic sensor networking ontology. It utilizes a, um, uh, uh, a representation uh, that we developed, uh, and uh, my group was a key uh, partner. I actually started the W3C group uh, that developed this um, um, uh, ontology uh, with uh, another guy um, at W3C. And um, uh, it ended up developing this particular ontology called SSN, Semantic Sensor Networking Ontology. So it uses that ontology, plus it uses this domain knowledge, right? And um, uh, in spite of all of the heterogeneity, this comes is standardized because it uses the same representation framework for um, um, uh, the data, even though data is coming from different sensors, and it also uses the same high level representation. So suppose there is um, uh, uh, something, uh, let's take an example of a chronic heart disease. Let's say that uh, the patient uh, you know, was discharged from hospital uh, after uh, his uh, heart surgery. And let's say that there are two different uh, sensors uh, that would be, um, uh, you know, uh, one is the pulse uh, that will tell you something about heart functioning. And another is uh, the um, weight scale, right? So assuming that there are two different uh, sensors here. Now, from medical context, clinical knowledge context, uh, if the patient's renal functions are not good, meaning kidneys are not working very well, patient will retain fluid. So there'll be swelling, and there'll be weight gain. So the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the scale will measure your uh, you know, uh, increase in weight. At the same time, pulse and blood pressure or other things um, may measure impact of the uh, body's retention of fluid on the vital organs, such as heart, and see the functioning. And you can find, for example, correlation occurring and understand it semantically that indeed that what might be happening here is uh, that uh, there is a, a swelling uh, and uh, uh, you know, retention of body fluid and that that is impairing your uh, you know, organ activities, right? So understand that, that we really, what, that is what doctor cares about, uh, a doctor cares about, that's what a patient cares about, right? 
And you can talk about all that at this level of uh, representation, not the uh, number, you know, for example, you give the number uh, 150 uh, pounds. So what? Nothing. But the fact that the weight went up in one day from 148 to 150 pounds is a big deal. Right? So it is a contextual interpretation of the data that is important. Right? Just two pound increase is also not important. Two pound increase in one day, uh, you know, one day, and it is uh, you know a, a heart patient. Right? That that all brings in uh, the things. So uh, the point here is that if I gave you the 150 number or 140 number, what what does it mean? Nothing. What can you do with it? This shows you very important role of semantics. That 150 became uh, tells you 140 and 120 says two pound increase in a day, 24 hour period. And that is actionable. And that is what, you know. So this is the power of semantics. And the interoperability is that, yeah, you have two very different um, sensors, and yet their data can be brought into the same application without too much work, and that you can make this correlation and you know, understand what is happening with the human body. Right? So, um, oops. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> There are uh, quickly some sample applications. So early um, <coughs> semantic search engine, uh, 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 then uh, enterprise application in health and life sciences, financial security, and then uh, some of the new applications that are emerging, particularly ones uh, in involving Internet of Things or social data streams and so on and so forth. So let me show you this application. Again, this is a powerful example of interoperability because the data comes from many different sources. In this case, what happens is that there, is a, uh, there, are, there are web crawlers that went to different websites and pulled up the news item. And then there is an aggregated news source that had 60, 95 different sources of data aggregated. South Africa's news agency, North Korea news agency, Singapore news agency, all of them coming in, financial reporting services. And they were, uh, they, that data will be were pushed to our system. This is, a, this is a slide from 2002 uh, from the company that I uh, developed. Uh, and then, um, you know, the crawler, so both of the, all this data coming in, so you can see the interoperability. The, all this data come from many sources. So here, uh, uh, automatic content aggregation from multiple content providers and feeds. Feeds pushed and pulled content providers, okay? Uh, here, all the data from different sources are being categorized. So here, um, it says company news, uh, analy ana ana analysis news, uh, earning news, industry and competition news, market commentary news, and margin acquisition news. So end user here is a stock broker or somebody in the stock market, right? And um, that person needs all, you know, this is his or her dashboard, and that, um, it brings together data from many sources, that's one thing. It automatically classifies it, right? So these are classifiers that were there. But in this classifier, there's one unique one. There, here, this I cannot do simply using the classifier. I have the knowledge base in my ontology says, for this company, Motorola, which is of course, which was acquired by Google. So there is no Motorola stock now, but um, Motorola, the knowledge base tells me who are the competitors of Motorola and who are, uh, you know, uh, what industry Motorola belongs to, say telecommunication or, uh, you know, uh, uh, cell phone manufacture, whatever the industry types are. So then it is that knowledge that is used to then find the uh, stock symbols or stock com company names of the competitor of Motorola and then this is the news for them, right? So see how the synergy between uh, ontological knowledge and uh, you know other stuff, uh, you know, traditional techniques uh, work here. Additionally, <coughs> uh, so yeah, it says related, you know, uh, you know, related relevant content not explicitly asked for. Nobody exactly give the uh, the um, uh, stock symbols of computers. In fact, if the knowledge base changes, this automatically will change. And then here you will get competitive uh, research inferred automatically. And it will give you two exact links, like key stats, income, cash flow, 
uh, broker rating directly about Motorola from different websites. It's again a powerful example of interoperability and integration. It is possible because the system understands I'm talking about Motorola. So linking here doesn't take you to Keystat page, a landing page. It takes you to exactly Motorola Keystat. Right? And here is the real time data uh, coming in from the stock market, streaming data coming in. Right? Constantly updated real time data. So this was uh, 2002. And the process, uh, kind of remember the picture I showed you earlier. I create the ontology and I create this knowledge agent and then I aggregate the knowledge and I query the ontology. These are some, this is one piece of the knowledge that will, you know, that will be created. Now let's see what happens here in this application. This was an application for a customer. This was from 2004. So in that, and this was for, uh, you know, in 2011, 9-11, uh, sorry, no, nine, 2001, no, no, 2000, 2001, yeah. Um, after the 9-11, uh, there was this Patriot law. And Patriot law, uh, you know, put in um, certain regulations for financial industry, which required that anybody trying to open, any person or, or um, organization trying to open an account, you have to do certain checking to make sure they're not involved in any negative activities. So this was application for that, called anti-money laundering or know your customer application. And so given some you know, name, it will go and watch uh, you know, against variety of things and pick up different connections in the watch list and company that they work for, and then give you something uh, whereby it says, this guy appears on some watch list, works for a company which is a member of, uh, which is a band organization, this kind of stuff. Right? Uh, alternative was for the bank, uh, you know, employees to do Google and try to figure out. That's what they were using, by the way. It's called Sneaker Brigade. There's another one where you have a multi, you can see many different types of data sources, right? So this, this is a variety. Law enforcement data, regulation data, public reports data, and so on and so forth, public research data. And all of those things were brought together to make all the connections so that, uh, you know, this was the application we are called customer identification and risk assessment application. Uh, that's what my company sold uh, in the, you know, uh, so this company is trying to open it and then it says is related to Wojtek Morawski, he's, uh, you know, uh, is uh, somebody related to Rabita Trust and Rabita Trust offered on the FBI watch list. So multiple, you know, links, right? This was employed at the majority of world's uh, 30 bank. Okay, let me, uh, this is the last slide. Ricardo is looking at the watch. <laughs> uh, we are like 40, 50 minutes late. <laughs> no, why, why? No, no. no we, we finish in two hours, yeah. We have 15 minutes to, so we'll have uh, break time. This is the last slide. So let me bring all these together. So you have a variety of data, structured text, Scientific publication, white papers, we are talking about scientific papers in the morning today. Experimental results, um, or it may be satellite data or whatever that is, right? Clinical trials data, I'm giving you example from medical, but I can, you can make this thing for anywhere. And then public domain uh, knowledge. For all this, this is an example of big data, a variety of big data, right? Uh, and that, uh, what I have is a variety of domain, specific and domain uh, independent ontologies, background knowledge, terminological coherence. With regards to, the, with this use of that, I create all these semantic annotations or metadata for all the data that I want. And then I develop this, um, you know, ability to find patterns, do inferencing, do reasoning and develop a variety of things. So I can have knowledge discovery thing, I have 2D, 3D visualizations, I can have, uh, you know, uh, impacting some, some reports that are created. I support search, browsing, personalization, knowledge discovery, all different kinds of stuff that I want, right? Just to give you an idea. And of course, this will, as we go through this course, we'll see many more examples of that. So I think that is the end of, here is an example, by the way, the morning talk, uh, where is Sujan? Sujan here? He laughed. Okay. 
So, so you, you, you're talking about finding the, this is one of the Swanson's uh, hypothesis. And the idea is to find this kind of, uh, you know, things. This was, this is the work that um, Sujan did, uh, sorry, Kartik did, that's why I mentioned him in the morning. All right, so that is the second module. Any questions now? Yeah. So in terms of um, uh, data integration and interoperability, uh, so do, do, are, are you using any of the uh, ontology alignment, for example, in the work that you mentioned before? Yeah, I, we did ontology alignment. Um, we had a pay, we had a work called Observer that was in 1996, and uh, that was a work called multi ontology query processing. In that sense, indirectly, you had to deal with multiple ontologies. And the moment you start dealing with multiple ontologies, um, you may and the different ontologies represent the same concept. You have to do alignment, or to say uh, which concepts are the same in different ontologies and which are different. Uh, is an alignment issue. Nevertheless, um, I have several, you know, uh, concerns with regards to the ontology alignment, uh, as such, and, and as the word used today and as it is practiced today. Uh, there is a well-known competition being run a, a called ontology alignment um, thing, and in fact, one of my PhD student, uh, his dissertation was on ontology alignment. So Pratik uh, Jain's, uh, on, you know. This was an ontology environment. He developed some neat algorithms uh, for doing just the same. Today's ontology alignment um, problem is very weak in that it is looking for very, you know, same as and some very limited form of relationships. The real world is a lot richer. So the number of relationship types involved with the real world are uh, much more broader than anything that is attempted today in the ontology alignment literature. Even in the older days that we had looked at, we had looked at semantic uh, equivalence, semantic re re uh, relationships, semantic resemblance, uh, semantic relatedness, variety of things, and we tried to define that. We looked at something called semantic proximity. Some of you may have looked at that. Broader concept of how the two things are objected. Fundamentally, it comes down to deciding are these two concepts same or different. And the moment you say they are not exactly the same and they are different, there is a wide variety of possibilities. Are they linguistically different? Are they different in uh, you know the kind of things? So suppose say um, adult concept of an adult. Is it adult as an adult who can vote, or adult who can uh, have alcoholic drink? One is 18 very often, other is 21 very often, right? Or something like that. And it varies by state by set. So where are you, what, you know, which state you are talking about, in fact, would vary that. Or, or, or adult as in driver's license, somebody who can get driver's license. So um, the real world nuances are not captured in the competition. And yet, the alignment techniques are still quite weak. So that's one issue about it. Um, uh, Trying to um, create coherence across the ontologies that were very independently developed is inherently extremely hard job. Because you not capture what is the context in which that ontology was created, what assumption was created, what was the quality that did. So data quality issue, quality, understanding of the quality of that is also very important. Provenance is very important. Uh, it can, can I merge to concept? Um, um, you know, can I uh, can I say uh, Hillary Clinton is the first lady of United States? Well, before uh, January 20, 20th, 2000, and was yes. After that, no, right? So things are inherently a lot more complex when you try to do that. And there's a comment that Emmanuel made earlier uh, that um, uh, you know it's okay, you, you know. When you're trying to do something that is broad based and the knowledge that does not change uh, frequently is easier, and that is the kind of thing, for example, some of them are focusing on right now. And that is the right thing to do because other things are inherently very hard to do. But there are a lot more um, uh, you know, opportunities for research as you go towards um, a support of these techniques um, that are also uh, current. So where, which uh, they not only deal with variety that I discuss, but also address the velocity issue as the world changes. 
So we will have more opportunity to talk about what you just asked. Yeah. And then there is a uh, data integration problem to remember, which is efficiency of a query answering. The, if you have uh, one of the two extreme, global as a view or local as a view, then there are techniques uh, that allow you to do the data integration in a reasonable way. But if you start this uh, ontological alignment uh, in any possible way, you end up with what are called glove mappings. So there are partially love and partially gap and they end up in being un untreatable in the end. So you see, on the one side, you would like to have this multiple ontology represented, tons of different points of view that automatically align it, okay? That would be something that you desire because these ontologies are learned, you don't want to model them, blah, blah. But then you get to a point that if you want to engineer a real system, that will never work because uh, the, the kind of semantics that you capture is so heterogeneous that you end up not being able to treat it, okay? So somehow this is a sort of, uh, I mean, very high level point of view, you would like ontology alignment to work uh, and practical engineering thing, either you do it with the two extreme things or they do not work, uh, at least nowadays with the kind of things that we can put together, right? That is uh, also part of the yeah. feature. This is, by the way, what, you know, all this work happening in the brain and, uh, you know, machines replacing human thing. This is why it is going, still going to be very hard to do. Yeah. Just one of the many problems. All right. Uh, so what we're going to do is to take a break, um, uh, uh, five minutes break, seven minutes break, uh, come back as soon as possible, and uh, we'll try to start in five, seven minutes, the module number three.